and to this MSD sponsored symposium, which is entitled Chronic Cough and the EMD <laughs> New Perspectives. My name is Joaquim Mullol and I will be chairing the symposium. I work in the Rhinology Unit and Smell Clinic at the ENT department in Barcelona. And also I'm the head of the research team, Clinical and Experimental Respiratory Immunological Immunology in uh, EDVAPS Barcelona. Chronic cough is a difficult uh, to treat the syndrome. Professor Imran Satya uh, is a pneumonologist and assistant professor in respiratory medicine at the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health at McMaster University in Canada. And uh, he will deliver a lecture on From Cough in Health to Cough and Disease, the Multiple Pathways of uh, Chronic uh, Cough. And the second lecture is Professor Ken uh, Adman, is an ENT specialist and he is the chair of the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Geisinger Health System in Central Pennsylvania, the USA, and at the same time is the secretary and treasurer of the American Academy of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. He will deliver a lecture on facing the challenge, diagnosing and managing refractory chronic cough. And at the end, we hope to have five to ten minutes for some questions from the audience or for interaction between us. Professor Imran Satya, please, your, the stand is yours. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon from wherever you are in the world. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a lecture uh, on the topic of chronic cough with particular emphasis on the pathways, uh, the neurological pathways which might be uh, involved. These are my relevant disclosures. And the objectives of today's talk is really threefold. Firstly, I'm going to talk a bit about the definition and epidemiology, epidemiology of chronic cough, with particular emphasis on chronic cough, refractory cough, and unexplained chronic cough. Then I'm going to talk a bit about cough in health, what is the cough reflex, some of the sensory fibers and receptors involved in cough, but also some central mechanisms of cough. And then finally, I'm going to explore some mechanisms which involve the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system, particularly um, uh, problems related to uh, voluntary cough suppression and endogenous inhibitory control mechanisms. The first thing I wanted to say is that chronic cough is not a new disease. I managed to find uh, this book by William Stokes from 1837, who's a famous Irish physician, who in his chapter of chronic cough, which he calls chronic dry bronchitis, he has this um, amazing quote, which says, this is when distressing petrol or chest symptoms exist, the morbid physical signs absent, or if present, are yet revealing an amount of disease too slight to account for the symptoms, we may make the diagnosis of sympathetic irritation, i.e. neuronal irritation. So he was one of the first people to at least recognize that cough is a neurological disease. He then provided a very simple five-step approach uh, to diagnosing this chronic bronchitis, which I think is somewhat still relevant almost 200 years later now. He describes it as a dry, spasmodic, violent cough, the absence of physical signs of pulmonary disease, particularly in his era, uh, TB infection and emphysema, which are out of proportion, and the absence of laryngitis, organic disease in the vicinity of the trachea, and the healthy state of the pharynx. And finally, and perhaps the most important, is the fact that he recognized there was a failure of treatment directed towards chest disease, which controlled the coughing. 
So based on this, our current classification of cough is split into three criteria. Acute cough is cough which lasts for one to three weeks, which all of you will recognize are most commonly due to viral and bronchitis, uh, bacterial infections and pneumonia. Then you have this prolonged period from lasting three to eight weeks, which is often described as subacute cough, which is post-infectious. And then chronic cough uh, lasting more than eight weeks is the current definition by the American, European uh, and various international committees which have uh, defined chronic cough. And these are commonly associated with asthma, nasal disease and reflux disease. And I'm going to talk a bit about um, how that might be occurring today. I will also mention that some of you may be aware that maybe 20 years ago, uh, the old definition of chronic bronchitis, which was the three month definition of chronic cough has also been used. So cough is a common global problem. You'll see here from this meta-analysis from my colleagues Wu Jung Sung, that when they looked at 90 studies all around the world, the average prevalence in the community was almost 10%. But you'll see from this graph that the prevalence is highly variable with as high as 18% in Australia, 12 to 10% in Europe, but as low as four, three to 4% in Asia and Africa. And this could be due to the, the, the paucity of studies done in other continents outside of uh, the Western world, but also uh, possibly due to uh, other competing factors which may be more important to those people living in that country. This is novel data which has recently been published uh, by our group in Canada showing that the prevalence of chronic cough uh, in the general population of Canada is almost 16%, which is pretty high, one of the highest in the, in the world. Uh, but you'll see from this graph that coughing is very, very prevalent in current smokers, as you might expect. But even in former and non-smokers, um, the prevalence still is still almost 10 to 12%, and it does increase with age. One of the features of chronic cough in specialist clinics is that it has a unique uh, epidemiology in that it's almost twice as more common in females and males, and it tends to peak in the 50s and 60s. And we don't fully understand why it's more common in females or why it even peaks in the 50s and 60s. What about the common associated conditions? So this is data from Alan Maurice from almost 20 years ago, where he surveyed uh, a number of cough clinics around the world to look at what was the diagnosis that was attributed to the chronic cough. And you, what you'll notice here is that asthma syndromes, reflux disease, and rhinitis are the three common associated conditions. But you'll also see other conditions like chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, uh, post-viral. The second point I wanted to make was that um, the diagnosis that you get uh, uh, with chronic cough is also dependent on which specialist you go to see. If you go to see an asthma specialist, you're more likely to be diagnosed with asthma. And likewise, if you go to see a, uh, 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 an allergist, you more likely get diagnosed with allergic rhinitis. But let's take data from the phase three programs, which were conducted by Merck, the uh, two pivotal companion studies, COF-1 and COF-2, which recruited in total almost 2,000 patients. And what I wanted to highlight here was that at the bottom you'll see here that almost 60% of patients in COF-1 and COF-2 had this underlying refractory chronic cough, meaning that they had an underlying diagnosis, uh, which despite optimum treatment, people were still coughing. And about 40% had no condition whatsoever. And this is the breakdown of the three common conditions. You'll see here that um, if you look at any diagnosis, asthma, GERD, reflux, and rhinitis, approximately 40, 40, 30%. If you look at single diagnosis, it's about 18% asthma, 15% reflux, and about 8% rhinitis and upper airway cough syndrome. And if you look at triple diagnosis or multiple diagnosis, it's about 9% with have combination. And you'll be pleased to hear that in cough two is exactly the same, uh, almost exactly the same uh, data. I also wanted to bring this to show that in cough one and cough two, uh, people with refractory chronic cough, they were taking medications for obstructive airways disease, nasal preparation, analgesics and anti antihistamines, and even corticosteroids. But they were coughing despite having taken those medications. And that's why the 60% figure of refractory chronic cough is refractory to these treatments which I've just shown in this table. 
and 40% have no underlying treatable condition. In the next section of my talk, I want to talk a bit about cough uh, and the neurophysiology of chronic cough. So all of you will be imminently aware that cough is a protective airway defensive reflex, which is both under voluntary control and involuntary control, meaning that you can cough whenever you want to cough. All you have to do is think about it and you can uh, uh, induce a coughing. But it's also involuntary and at times you may begin to cough uh, without having much control. So this is the basic wired, wiring diagram, which I often show, showing that cough is controlled by vagal afferents, which um, uh, innervate the airways, uh, particularly the vagus nerve, uh, which has a delta fibers and C fibers. And when there's a stimulus which activates receptors on those nerve endings, actual potentials are uh, propagated and generated to the nucleus tractus solitarius, the thalamus, and then to the primary somatosensory cortex. And if the stimulus is high enough, you may get a throat irritation. And if it's a bit, a bit more, you might have an urge to cough. And eventually, you'll break that threshold. And eventually, this will make you cough. If we look a closer look at the receptors which are expressed on the C fibers and A delta fibers, you'll notice that on the, we know a bit more about the C fibers as they are more chemically sensitive and A delta fibers, which are more mechanosensitive. Trip V1 is one of the archetypal airway receptors which are found on C fibers and which are sensitive to capsaicin, which is the chili pepper extract, which makes you uh, develop heat when you, when you eat chili. But when you inhale this, it makes you cough. You have trip A1, which is activated by acrolein in smoke, uh, but also cinnamaldehydes in, in, um, in aerosols um, and also changes in temperature. Even things like wasabi and mustard oil will also activate trip A1. Uh, but also we have a new channel now, which uh, recently discovered called the P2X3 receptor, uh, which is bound and activated by ATP. And there's also other G protein coupled receptors, such as prostaglandin receptors and bradykinin receptors, which are all important cough. On the other hand, we have air delta fibers, which we know slightly less about, which are more uh, mechanosensitive. And as the cartoon here shows, you'll notice that these air delta fibers, they project to the subepithelium whereas the C fibers, they project more to the epithelial surface where they are more likely to detect stimulus. And uh, what they look like is, is more varicose, whereas the A delta fibers, they, the, they look like more of a tree and branch uh, appearance. A mucus can also affect A delta fibers uh, as well and, and hypotonicity and, and hypertonicity. So what might um, cause people to cough um, and I'm going to break this down um, by first explaining uh, some of the symptoms that patients describe. So patients describe some dry, irritating symptoms and 25% have productive cough. People often describe symptoms located in their throat or their chest, and they're often triggered by low levels of thermal, mechanical, uh, and chemical stimulations. And they're often troubled by a constant sensation of urge to cough. And these are just some quotes that I have from some of my patients. They say, I have a feeling of dripping behind my nose and onto my throat. I have a constant cough. I have to cough to get rid of that feeling. It's like a constant itch or something stuck. Once I start coughing, I find it difficult to stop. And simple things like talking can trigger my coughing. So how can we take this information and try to understand the mechanisms of chronic cough? So if we go back to our wiring diagram, it's likely that the cough pathway is uh, sensitized in either of those sections, the peripheral or central. But we also know that the vagus nerve has afferents or sensory afferents, which, coming, which come from the uh, bottom of the esophagus, but also from the nose, the trigeminal nerve also um, uh, uh, goes to the nucleus tractus solitarius. So I would hypothesize, and we often think about it like this, that there may be things happening in the peripheral nervous system, such as increased stimulation in the airways, the bottom of the esophagus, or in the nose, which can, uh, the increase or excessive stimulation would activate airway afferent nerves and cause uh, coughing. But also there may be hyperexcitability of airway nerves themselves, uh, the vagus nerve. And finally, there may be some impaired inhibitory controls. And for the next section, I'm going to talk a bit about each of these pathways in a bit more detail. So how do we study chronic cough uh, and the cough reflex? 
So this is uh, one of our participants, Helen, who, when you inhale capsaicin, this activates the vagus nerve, stimulation goes to the nucleus tractus solitarius, and then the larynx, intercostal muscles, and diaphragms are activated, causing chronic cough. So this is what we mean by the cough reflex art. And when we do this, we can do a, a cough dose response curve, which looks something like this. So this is data from Emma Hilton uh, from a couple of years ago now, showing that compared to healthy volunteers, you can clearly see that patients with chronic cough, they have a left shift in the dose response curve and an upward shift. And the kind of endpoints that we discover from this are the Emax, the maximum coughs here, the, where the plateau is reached, a dose that causes half this response called the ED50. And we also use two other endpoints called the C2, which is the dose of capsaicin causing two coughs and the dose of capsaicin causing five coughs. And you can detect from this some important neurophysiological mechanisms. So if there's a left shift in this dose response curve, what that suggests that there's a hypersensitivity. And this could be because of the receptors uh, on those nerve endings are sensitized, or it could be that there's more receptors being expressed, or it could also be that there's increased branching or free nerve endings, uh, which make it more easy for stimulus to activate those nerves. In contrast, there's also hyper-responsiveness. And this is often attributed to something called phenotypic switching, where previously dormant uh, nerves such as the A-delta fibers, which didn't express TRIP-V1, suddenly start to express novel TRIP-V1 on their nerve ending. So you're recruiting a completely new set of nerves. So you have phenotypic switching. There's also the concept of central sensitization and inhib in impaired inhibitory controls. And think of these like a brake system. So if you imagine that the, the way uh, the brain works is that generally there's a constant inhibition, a tonic inhibition, and in patients with chronic cough, if the brakes are taken off, then you're more likely to cough more at any given dose of capsaicin. Let's go through the peripheral mechanisms. So we know that in the airways that there's increased ATP and P2X3, and increased ATP um, can cause increased coughing. And this is data from Alan Maurice's group showing compared to healthy volunteers, again, when you make people inhale ATP and measure their coughing, you can clearly see that there's a hypersensitivity, uh, which is a left shift in the dose response curve uh, in the round uh, uh, um, uh, spots here. Uh, and there's a bit of a hyper responsiveness, a bit of an increase in Emax as well. And we also now know that if you inhibit this P2X3 receptor by using a, 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 a drug called Jefopixan, you get a, a, a dramatic reduction in the awake objective cough frequency. And this is data from the phase 2B program um, uh, looking at coughs over 12 weeks, uh, cough one and cough two over 52 weeks has now been, um, uh, is currently being evaluated uh, and will soon be published. But here you can clearly see that at the 50 milligram dose, there's a dramatic reduction in the objective cough frequency in patients taking this medication compared to placebo. What about mucus? So as I mentioned before, approximately 25% uh, of patients with chronic cough also describe a feeling of mucus uh, which is irritating their cough. And often the mucus can all, uh, sometimes it's only a very small amount of mucus, but that small amount of mucus can often trigger a lot of coughing. So we also have done some work around uh, allergen challenge. Some of you may be familiar with whole lung allergen challenge. When you can take people who are allergic and mild uh, asthmatics, you make them inhale um, house to smite allergen or cats, um, and you develop this uh, classic uh, early asthmatic bronchoconstrictor response within 30 minutes, which improves by about three hours. And there's a late asthmatic response, um, which occurs uh, after about three hours. And patients come back 24 hours later, and by which time bronchoconstriction has improved, but there's almost a tenfold increase in sputum eosinophilia. So what we did was we, at the point of bronchoconstriction, we made people inhale one dose of capsaicin or the ED50 dose of capsaicin. And what we demonstrated was, you can see on the left-hand side here, there's approximately 40% drop in FEV1 in the early asthmatic response. And when we gave them one dose of capsaicin, almost everybody demonstrated increased uh, capsaicin evoked coughs. So this suggests that bronchoconstriction does increase capsaicin evoked coughs. We also then brought the patients back 24 hours later. And by this time, FEV1 has almost come back up to baseline, bearing a few people. But despite the FEV1 improving, uh, capsaicin evoked coughs are still elevated and heightened, suggesting now that it's the remaining 
um, inflammation which is in the airways, which is driving the neuronal sensitization. What about nasal disease? So this is data from over 10 years ago from Tata et al, which showed that com compared to patients with healthy people, patients who have allergic rhinitis have a more sensitive capsaicin cough threshold measured by the C2. So here, the lower the number, the more sensitive your capsaicin, uh, your, your, your cough reflex is. But what interestingly they did on the left-hand panel is they also instilled saline or histamine into patients' noses. And when they then inhaled capsaicin, you can clearly see that compared to saline, when, you were, uh, when, when the nose was instilled with histamine, that somehow sensitized the vagal afferent nerves um, and, and, the, uh, and the trigeminal nerves, and then uh, can, it, it, it evoked uh, higher amounts of coughing, almost twice as high uh, compared to saline. So this suggests that the, the nerves in the nose can also be sensitized. What about the stomach? So this is a data from Sam de Kalma um, and Jackie Smith's group in Manchester, where they uh, put uh, 20, did it, they, they conducted 24 hour pH impedance study by over 24 hours. And at the same time, they measured the objective coughs. So on the left hand side, the, 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 the most salient feature in this is that you're able to measure acid reflux, non-acid reflux, proximal reflux, and all reflux events. And I think as you can see here, what's interesting is that compared to healthy volunteers, patients with chronic cough don't demonstrate increased amounts of acid reflux or non-acid or proximal events. But what happened was we were able to, uh, or they were able to break down the 24 hour periods into two minute blocks. Um, and to understand is that, is there a temporal relationship between reflux and cough? Because if reflux causes cough, then you should expect that within two minutes of a reflux episode, you should then cough. So what they actually found was that happens maybe reflux cough in about 48%. But interestingly, there's more episodes, maybe 56% in where there's a cough and then a reflux. And almost a third of patients demonstrated no temporal relationship. So that suggests that um, cough in itself can provoke reflux and then cough, reflux, cough can cause this vicious circle of sensitization. And this is the study by, uh, uh, from, from Slovi uh, Slovakia showing this very nicely. To show that here in patients um, uh, who don't have chronic cough, when you instill their esophagus with acid uh, and then make them inhale capsaicin, that there's no difference whether you're, you're in the acid arm versus the saline arm. But in those who people have chronic cough, when you instill their esophagus uh, with some acid, you'll notice here that there's a drop in capsaicin C2, meaning that by instilling the acid into the lower esophagus, somehow you've sensitized the afferent nerves of the esophagus, which is actually making you cough more when you inhale capsaicin at lower doses. So the conclusion from this study was that acid effusion has no effect on cough reflex sensitivity in healthy controls, but it significantly reduces cough reflex sensitivity in patients with chronic cough. So moving on, um, recently there's been some work done by the Oregon group led by Matthew Drake and David Jacoby, who've taken biopsies from the lung and the endobronchial uh, areas of patients with, healthy, uh, with chronic cough and healthy controls. And what you can see here on the left-hand side is that you can see here that they've stained the nerves with PGP 9.5 and neurofilament. And what you can see here is that patients with chronic cough have increased branching and that there's more nerves as well. So not only are there more nerves, they're more lengthy and they're more branched. And that's what you can demonstrate here on, on the right-hand side. So this suggests that if you can imagine the airway and the, there's more nerves, that any small amount of stimulus has more probability on landing on a free nerve terminal and thereby uh, evo uh, uh, provoking coughing. What about central sensitization? So this is a work done by Stuart Mazzoni in Australia uh, where they did some complicated um, experiments, which I'll try to break down in a simple format. So they conducted first a uh, capsaicin cough challenge. And what they wanted to do was, uh, when you're in the fMRI, you don't want people to cough. So what they did was they first matched the uh, urge to cough intensity before they went into the scanner. So on, uh, in, the, in, the, in the graph here, which is matching intensity, you can see here 
that they try almost it's about five out of 10 on the bulk scale that they got uh, patients with healthy controls and chronic cough to match. But you'll notice that people with chronic cough required a much lower dose of capsaicin to get the same urge to cough intensity. And then they matched a stimulus where a small stimulus caused a uh, different or a higher urge to cough sens uh, sensitivity, but they didn't cough because you don't want them to cough in the MRI. And then during these challenges, um, you, you did uh, blood flow MRI, fMRI measurements. And what they noticed was that in compared to healthy controls, um, there was increased activity in the midbrain, particularly the periaqueductal gray matter, uh, the rostroventral medulla, and the dorsal raphe nucleus, suggesting there's increased activity on central sensitization. But interestingly, at the same time, they, saw, they demonstrated reduced activity in some areas of the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and the inferior um, uh, frontal gyrus. And this suggests that there's increased activity in the midbrain, but decreased activity higher up in the, in, in the prefrontal cortex, suggesting potential impaired cough suppression pathways, which is what Sarinda Burrings and his colleagues showed uh, in a recent study published in the ERJ, where on the left-hand side, what they made people do is they made them uh, do the capsaicin cough challenge and worked out their C5, which you can see here uh, on the right. But then they asked patients to try your best not to cough voluntarily. And what they can see here is that in patients with healthy controls, there's an increase in capsaicin concentration causing two coughs and five coughs, meaning that they're able to uh, tolerate higher doses of capsaicin. So that's, that means that, that that system is working. But you'll notice here on the other side, in patients with chronic cough, they're not able to do that. So they have impaired voluntary cough suppression. And this is one uh, theme which is now emerging. But I would put it to you that people who don't cough, uh, healthy people who don't have chronic cough, we don't walk around thinking or wanting to suppress our cough all throughout the day. It's happening all the time. So this has led, to, uh, led us to conduct this study where we wanted to understand um, whether or not there's in, impaired endogenous inhibitory control mechanisms. And the way to do this is to study pain. Uh, so the way we did this is that we put a uh, patient's non-dominant left hand in cold water. And this is well known in the pain literature that when you do that, it initiates inhibitory neurons from the higher brain to the lower brainstem to inhibit pain. So we wanted to see whether or not by doing this, putting your hand in cold water and then immediately inhaling capsaicin during that uh, uh, 120 second episode, does that reduce your urge to cough? That meaning that you get less cough sensations and do you also cough less? And whether that's different between healthy controls and patients with chronic cough. So these are the results. On the left-hand side in figure A, you'll see that um, if on measured by the bulk scale, that in gray, the healthy volunteers and the patients with refractory chronic cough, just by putting your hand in cold water, it reduces your urge to cough sensations. So that was the first thing. But secondly, what we also found is that when you put your hand in cold water and activate these inhibitory control mechanisms, you get a dramatic reduction, almost more than 50%, in coughs in, evoked by capsaicin in the healthy volunteers. So in healthy volunteers, this impaired inhibitory controls is working very well. However, in patients with refractory control, chronic cough, that inhibitory control mechanism isn't working nowhere near uh, as good as patients with healthy, healthy controls, suggesting that there is an impaired inhibitory control mechanism in, in, in chronic cough. So in summary, um, I hope I've, convince you that chronic cough is a common problem which affects approximately 10% of the general population. There are common conditions such as nasal disease, asthma, and reflux, but up to 40% have no underlying condition. Cough is a protective defensive reflex, which is both under involuntary and voluntary control. And now we're beginning to understand that patients with chronic cough have a dysregulated uh, vagal reflex, which can involve both the peripheral and central mechanisms controlling cough. I'm going to stop there and thank all of my colleagues at McMaster and Manchester, and also my funding bodies uh, in the ERS, the BMA, the NIHR, and the Northwest Lung Center Charity.
Uh, thank you very much all for listening. I'm going to stop my sharing and hand it over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Ken Altman.